Good morning, church. Um, I'm going to be reading from Acts 17, 16 till the end of that chapter. Um, <laughs> Paul in Athens. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed when he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worship God, as well as in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also debated with him. Some said, what is this ignorant show of trying to say? Others reply, he seems to be a preacher of foreign deities because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. They took him and brought him to the Areopagus and said, may, may we learn about this new teaching you are presenting? Because what you say sounds strange to us and we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians at the, and the foreigners residing there spend their time on nothing else but telling or hearing something new. Paul stood in the middle of the Areopagus and said, people of Athens, I see that you are extremely religious in every respect. For as I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship, I even found an altar on which was inscribed to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by hands. Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since, since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. From one man, he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointment, appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. He did this, he did this so that they might see God and perhaps they might reach out and find him. Through he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of you own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Since then, we are God's offspring. We shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art and imagination. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man that he has appointed. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some began to ridicule him, but others said, we'd like to hear from you again about this. So Paul left their presence. However, some people joined him and believed, including Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Amaris and others with them. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you so much for the reading, Curry. Much appreciated, fam. Good morning. My name is Reino. If we have not met, I have the privilege of serving this church as pastor, and I have the privilege of teaching God's word this morning, and I'm very, very excited about the passage that Curry just read. Um, I've really enjoyed our morning so far, loved the worship, loved all the announcements, really excited about announcing uh, Shiami's journey to eldership, and most excited probably about the way that Lerato hosted us for the very first time. Fam? Yeah, 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 yeah. Look, there's nothing like hosting for the first time, Lerato. And you are now done, and you have passed with distinction. And I already cannot wait to have you host again. And you'll see the second time you are going to be on fire. Yeah, so you did really, really well. Thank you so much for hosting us. Okay, before we jump in, uh, we haven't been in Acts for two weeks now because it was birthday service last Sunday. Let's pray, and then we'll get going. Lord Jesus, your word is alive, it cuts deep deep to the point of joint and marrow, soul and spirit. We learn something about you and about us and about our mission in the world every single time we open up the Bible, and we know that today is no different. Um, I pray that this story today would enthrall our minds, would mobilize us, would inspire us, and that we will learn today what it is that you want us to learn.
I'm always humbled by the fact, Lord Jesus, that you are now going to speak through my vocal cords to a diversity of people, and each one will have the ability to hear what they need to hear. So I pray that your spirit illuminates, that your spirit convicts, and that your spirit leads as we work through this text. May your name be glorified, Lord Jesus, as we, uh, as we open up your word. You are our Lord, we are your servants, and we are keen to listen. Speak to us now, we pray. In your name. Amen. So you guys know when you watch seri- when you watch series, it starts with previously in the book of Acts. Okay. So two weeks ago our theme was the gate is open. And we asked the question, who can be saved now that the gate is open? I'm just recapping. We spoke about Lydia, a Greek slave girl and a Roman jailer. We spoke about God-fearing people, spiritually tormented people, and practical and indifferent people. We spoke about rich people, poor people, and working people. And in that sermon, I made the point that the gate is open, and truly anyone can be saved now that the gate is open. Let's head to our map. Uh, When we preached out of Acts two weeks ago, we were still in Philippi, which is right up top there in Macedonia. And uh, Acts chapter 16 verse 40 says, after leaving the jail, you guys will remember that the jail doors broke open and the jailer tended to Paul and Silas. And then it says, after leaving the jail, they came to Lydia's house where they saw and encouraged the brothers and sisters and departed. Okay, work in Philippi, done. Then Acts 17 verse 1 starts with, After they passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. Okay, so follow the arrow. So Philippi first, then Amphipolis, then through Apollonia, and then we reach Thessalonica. Okay? And then it says in 17 verse 1, there was a Jewish synagogue. Verse 2, as usual, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days reasoned with them from the scriptures. Paul spent only three weeks in Thessalonica. He planted a church in those three weeks. And when he wrote back to the Thessalonians, two letters actually, one Thessalonians and two Thessalonians, he says to them, I'm so encouraged and so pleased and so thankful for the way that you guys are growing, that you're giving, that you're proclaiming, and that you're working. Just think about that. Three weeks of sowing, and the result is a church that's thriving, that gets two letters from the person who planted them. Now, why did Paul leave after three weeks? I mean, he would have wanted to stay for longer. He had to leave because there was a colossal riot in Thessalonica, which was stirred up by the Jewish people there, rejecting his message. So once again, Paul proclaims, people come to faith, other people don't, they reject him, and he's in trouble, and he's being persecuted again. Now look at 17, verse 10 to 15, I put it on the screen for you. It says, as soon as it was night, the brothers and sisters sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. Upon arrival, ah, surprise, surprise, they do exactly the same, they went into the synagogue of the Jews, Uh, the people here were Uh, of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, since they received the word with eagerness and examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Wouldn't that be an awesome testimony of Fellowship City, huh? People who receive the word with eagerness and who examine the scriptures daily. Consequently, verse 12, many of them believed, including a number of the prominent Greek women as well as men, But the Jews from Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul at Berea. They came there too, agitating and upsetting the crowds. Then the brothers and sisters immediately sent Paul away to go to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed on there. Those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving instructions for Silas and Timothy to come to him as quickly as possible, they departed. Can we just go back to the map quickly? So they leave Thessalonica. They reach Berea, they keep on proclaiming the message, it goes well, people come to faith, but the Thessalonians hate Paul and Silas and their message so much that they actually follow them to Berea. So you'll see that's actually quite a short distance between Thessalonica and Berea. And then the believers tell them, listen dude, you really have to put some space between you and these people because they're either going to take you into custody or they're going to charge you or they're going to kill you. And then Paul leaves alone all the way to Athens comes to Athens and tells the people who brought him there, guys, listen, thank you so much for everything. I really appreciate it. Will you please go back all the way and tell the other two gents to come here? (laughs) I'll wait for them right here. And that's exactly how it happened. 
Now, this experience that Kari read for us is one of the most popular stops along Paul's missionary journeys, and one of the most popular passages, actually, in the book of Acts, and this is Paul's visit to Athens. Now, why is it so important? Because it gives us insight into the heart and ministry of Paul, and it teaches us really important lessons for how to engage unbelievers in this day. Lou provides a little bit of a look at the city of Athens, and then he focuses our attention as he writes on Paul's speech at the Areopagus. I'll show you a picture a little bit later. Now, this speech shows us an example of how Paul evangelized Gentiles, how Paul spoke to people with virtually no background in Scripture. And I think that's why this passage is so important. Do you guys realize in a Christian country like in South Africa where many people say that they went to church, you often speak to people who can't even tell you the Bible story. We think people know. They might know David and Goliath and Jonah and something about someone being born in a manger. But if you ask the stock standard South African, just take me through the story. Creation, fall, Israel, Jesus, the spirit in the church and redemption. Not a lot of people will be able to tell you the whole story. So we often converse with people who are very, very smart in their heads and according to their own credentials, but they know nothing about the Bible. And now Paul goes, well, I'm speaking to people like that, and we'll see how he does it. The other example of Paul preaching to pagan Gentiles was found in his speech in Lystra. You might remember that. I preached that from Acts chapter 14. And in both of those cases, Paul starts with creation, and then he moves forward into the redemptive story of Jesus. And he addresses and confronts idolatry. You guys with me? So if we want to engage unbelievers like Paul, we need to know the following. Here's my four points for today. We need to know what Paul saw. We need to know what Paul felt. We need to know where Paul went. And we need to know what Paul said. See, feel, go, speak. Why is this important? John Stott, the late Anglican priest, said the following, We do not speak like Paul because we do not feel like Paul. And this is because we do not see like Paul. So I want to be like Paul. I mean, reading Acts really motivates me to be like him. And John Stott says the one reason why we're not is because we don't speak like him, we don't feel like him, and we don't see like him. Okay, so let's start with number one. What Paul saw. Acts chapter 17, verse 16. It says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed when he saw that the city was full of idols. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he pulled out his phone and he went down a three-hour rabbit hole on WhatsApp status. Paul took some time to catch up on his reels. Paul read the newspapers. Paul took a nap. Paul never takes time off. He's literally waiting. And he goes, oh my word, I can't believe what I'm seeing. And what does he see? That the city was full of idols. Can we talk about idols? Let's talk about money. Money is an idol in this church, in this community, in this city, in this country, on this continent, and in this world we live in. Rich folk want more, poor folk want more, and everyone between rich and poor want more. And therefore we worship money because we believe if we have more, then we will feel what we long to feel. Then we will be where we long to be. Then that sense of fulfillment will come. Then the thing that's empty inside of me will be filled. I've got no idea exactly what it is. All I know is more. The levels of debt in South Africa tells you that people worship money. The levels of corruption in South Africa tells you that people worship money. Because the moment I can get my hand on money, I take it. Because I believe that it will bring me something. Generosity, freely giving because we freely received, living below our means so that we are able to give away more just isn't something in our framework. It is part of the Christian framework. Do you realize that you can spend less if you have a lot and then give away more and shrink your life a bit? It doesn't always have to be more. It doesn't always have to be better. But money is an idol in the world we live in because we esteem these things. Oh, new car, awesome. Oh, beach house, so beautiful. Best new watch, it's so great. New sneakers, it's awesome. 
And the very reason that we esteem these things tells us that we worship them. It's not going to fully and finally satisfy you. You should know it. Let's talk about sex. Is sexual abuse a problem in South Africa? It's a huge problem. South Africa ranks in the top 10 countries in the world in terms of pornography consumption. Why? Because people want it. And they want it on their own means, on their own time, at their own accord, and they will take it when they can get it, even if it is by force or if it is hidden in the dark places. Why? Because if I could just have that feeling of euphoria again, if I could just have this thing that I'm worshipping on my own standards, then I'll be fulfilled. We worship sex in this country. I run a lot. And I run past a lot of people. Do you know what pains me? It's if I run down a street and I see a woman walking on her own on this side of the street and I'm a gents on this side of the street and I know that they're going to say something. And what they say is not, good morning sister, I hope that you're well. Have a blessed day. It's a whistle, it's a gesture, she blushes, they have a little chatter among each other. Boom! Pierces my heart. Because gentlemen, keep it in. But they don't. Lust is so rife in this world we live in. We worship sex. Let's talk about power. Is physical abuse a problem in South Africa? Is emotional abuse a problem in South Africa? Is verbal abuse a problem in South Africa? All of these things are problems in South Africa because we worship power. We love having control over someone or something else. And as long as I can lord over someone or something, I will have my way, even if it comes with a strong arm. Because we feel valuable. We feel seen. We feel important. All of these things that we long to feel that God gives to us by calling us His children who He created in His image, each one unique, and gives them an opportunity to be His sons and daughters, we look for that in a different place. So if I walk into a place and my presence is felt, and I can lord over people, then I feel like I've made it. This is the world we live in. We worship power. And lastly, we worship status and we worship influence. Fam, no jokes. I preached at a grade 7 gathering on Friday. And I wanted to say, kids, none of you should aspire to be an influencer. None of you should think that YouTube's going to pay the bills one day. Don't do it. But that's what people think will make you seem important. Influence, platform, presence, followers. If only I could be a celebrity. Do you know what the good news is about all of our news channels reporting more and more locally? Is you can see that our local celebrities are just as broken as Hollywood celebrities. Back in the day, we read the tabloids and the entertainment news and we were like, Oh, Hollywood, what a wretched place. Oh, South Africa, what a wretched place. Our celebrities go through the same thing. But we think... We think that they are more important than anyone else. Because we worship status. We worship influence. I could go on. But these are the four things that I believe in our community in our day is most visible. They were all good things. They were all made to bless us and to create flourishing for us. But they've been made ultimate things. And the moment you make a good thing an ultimate thing, it becomes a terrible thing. That's called idolatry, fam. So what does it take to see that the city is full of idols? Lift your head. Look up. I greet every single person I see on a run every single morning. This morning, this morning, as I was coming down Skullpot Avenue in Monument Park, there was a guy, he had overhead headphones on, cans, walking like this on his phone. And I went, Eta, 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 boom, right into him. I saw him, he didn't see me. And I passed him, quick chase and Colby, and he just carried on. He's not the only person doing that, you know. 
we have to turn our gaze just a little bit above all our own stuff that keeps us so blinded. That's a way in which the enemy is distracting us from a mission. Just make people busy. Just keep people distracted. Just put the old blinders on. No time for neighbors. No time for nations. No time for giving. No time for socializing. No time for hospitality. <laughs> Check this real. It's brilliant. That's how we roll. If you want to see idols, you also need to look in. Do you know that you also worship these idols? And that working against the idolatry of these things is a daily practice. A daily practice. Or it's just me. I'm the only sinner in the house. But I have to consciously, daily, repent of these things. And fill my mind with the gospel and my heart with the love of Christ. And then we also... Look out. Make time to sit and just look. What do you do while you drive? Do you ever have that feeling of I'm going from point A to B and I reach point B and I've got no idea how I got there? Just look up a bit. See who's walking the streets. See who's begging at the traffic lights. See who's going to school and who's coming from school. See who's looking for work. See who's giving work. See who's having leisure time. See who's having shopping time. Open your eyes. Paul did it. And he saw that the city was full of idols. Let's look at what Paul felt. Verse 16. Again, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, I've got a new highlight for you. He was deeply distressed when he saw that the city was full of idols. Paul had a heart for the city. Paul had a heart for people. There was something going on in Paul's heart that made him feel nations, neighbors, families, and friends. Everyone has to know. So I'm chilling, waiting for my guys. But while I'm here, I might just as well tell someone that I've got good news that I want to share with them. Do you see it? Paul didn't stay in Athens. He didn't know Athens that well. I don't know if he has been in Athens before. But he's like, while I'm here, let me share some good news. My heart burns for these people. There's a new song that we sing as part of our worship repertoire. Send us to the nations. Send us to our neighbors. And everyone in between our neighbors and our nations, our hearts should be distressed for them. Fam, if you're a Christian, you feel some stuff. Do you know that? Jesus is described in Isaiah 53 as a man of sorrows. Acquainted with grief, Jesus himself in John 11, he wept, he got enraged. Paul, who we're learning about at the moment, says in numerous places, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing. Paul speaks about the feelings he has. So it shouldn't surprise us, it should challenge us, that when, Paul, uh, when Luke writes of Paul, he says he was deeply distressed, his spirit was troubled. Now, that's an interesting word used in the Greek. The best way that I could translate it is, Paul got a spasm in his heart. He, he had heart pain. That's what he felt. You know that feeling? Oh, something pierces my heart. Paul looked. He saw the idols and he went, Oh, my heart is in a spasm for these people. He has a mixture of what we could call righteous indignation for the name of God, right? This is not right. That's part of Paul's feeling. And then on the other hand, he has compassion for these people because he can see that they do want to worship and they are looking, they're just looking in the wrong place. So Paul loves both God and he loves people. Do you know our discipleship journey, our triangle, right in the middle it says, loves God, loves people. So Paul is motivated by his love for God and his love for his neighbor. He's got gentleness towards the people and he's got boldness. Paul looks a lot like Jesus now, doesn't he? Jesus rebuked people boldly and he was gentle with people. Why? Because he longed to see people sing for joy to their creator and to their redeemer. Do you long to see people sing for joy to their creator and the redeemer? Is that what you long for? If not, then the question is, how can I grow in my feelings towards others? 
And what's the answer to that question? How do you grow in your feelings towards others? You meditate on the cross of Jesus. Fam, the more you look at the cross of Jesus, the more you meditate on it, the more you see God's absolute commitment to perfect holiness and then His unbelievable love and unfathomable compassion to us as sinners, the more it works with your heart. And the more it works with your heart, the more you grow in truthfulness on the one hand and in tears, in gentleness to people and in boldness. You grow in holiness, being set apart, and you grow in love because you look at the world through a different lens. Paul had a different worldview than the people in Athens. He saw the cross. And the cross should be, should be central to all of our worldviews. We are a gospel-centered church. The cross is everything to us. And it gives us the heart we need to engage the Athenians in our lives. Here's what I mean. You see someone and you see something. You know that it's wrong. But you are filled with compassion for that person. Why? Simple answer. Because Jesus died on the cross for that person. Period. Any human being on this earth, that's, that counts for. I don't care what you think about them. I don't care how you feel about them. He died for every single one of them. Gaze on the cross. If you've become numb to other people, if you've become frustrated with people, if you've become irritated or agitated with other people, think of the cross and then look at them through that lens. Last Wednesday, I told the story to Martin as we were in D group. I had two opportunities to share the gospel. One in the office of Home Affairs and another one in the parking lot of Centurion Mall. I missed both. Because the people who I had to share the gospel with irritated me and I just, I, I, it's like I was blinded. So the lady at the Home Affairs office said a whole lot of stuff that absolutely tripped me up, but I was irritated with her because she was killing the whole vibe in the office and I wanted to chat to my mate. And the guy in Centurion Mall, well, he wasn't where he was supposed to be, so I was irritated with him. <laughs> and later that afternoon as I reflected on the day, I went, no, no. I sat two chairs from this lady and I had an opportunity to share the gospel and I did it. Because I didn't look at her through the lens of the cross. And I had an opportunity to share the gospel with a guy in the parking lot of Centurion Mall. I actually wasn't in a hurry anywhere. I was hangry, but I ate before I left the mall. Then I'm just a better person. I could have stopped and went, dude, it's really interesting to see you here. I have never seen you here. And there's an opportunity because he was hustling, trying to make a living, extorting people for money. I could have shared the gospel with him and I didn't. You see, the heart is where your whole perception of people starts. And Paul had a heart for the nations. Let's look at where Paul went. So look at verses 17 and 18 first. He reasoned in the synagogue, as well as in the marketplace every day, with those who happened to be there. Okay, so first group, synagogue, second group, marketplace, anyone really. And then third group, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also debated with him. Okay, so let's just do synagogue quickly. Paul always goes to the synagogue because Paul knows there are people there who want to serve God. They want to live according to his law. They are waiting on God's promises. I might just as well tell them that uh, it's been fulfilled in Jesus Christ now. I've got good news for them. That should help us to remember that when we get together as Christians, we don't chat about sundowns versus chiefs and the heat wave. We should still talk about the gospel, you know. We should still talk about God. Because I can't just assume that all of you are awesome in your devotion to Jesus at this moment. We should uh, encourage each other. We should fan into flame the passion we have for Jesus. And that's exactly what Paul does. Paul doesn't go, nah, they'll be alright. I'm going to go to the more lost people. No, Paul goes, everyone needs to hear. And for us, if you know people who are Christians, you should still talk to them about God and the gospel and Jesus. And you should still witness and testify to them. That's what we are called to do. Then secondly, Paul goes to the marketplace and he dialogues with people in general. Okay? So think of marketplace. Let's go, 
let's go east, uh, Jean, west, John Foster, north, Hendrik Vervoort, south, Alexandra. Like if you think of that block in Centurion, that is a good reference for what the marketplace would be in a place like Athens. I know I just lost many of you. I see the question marks. Think more than the mall. Okay. So don't think Churi small. Don't think Shisanyama and the like. Think a little bit wider. Okay. More like Centurion CBD and surrounding areas, which includes the Uvis and Dwarenkloof. There you go. Okay. Why such a big place? Because the Agora in the New Testament, that's what the marketplace is called, uh, it contained everything. Town officials deliberating, artists creating, business people dealing, the media was reporting there. Do you know how you read news in the olden days? You walked up and you heard someone say, uh, yesterday in Corinth, the following happened. People would herald. They would bring news. They would share what's happening around the place. So that's where you would hear the media reporting. That's where philosophers were debating. And that's where you could learn. I mean, it's not like you could go to the library and go, let me get the teachings of Socrates off the uh, shelf here and do some reading on my own. Only 2% of people could read in that time. So it was an oral community. So everyone was banking on how good they can hear. And in the marketplace, listen to this, people are open to it. So I believe that we should do it. All of us are around the marketplace every single day. I promise you, in this country called South Africa, if you say, how's it? No one is going to say, forget you, get out of my way. <laughs> Not in South Africa. We are a how's it people. It's really easy to talk to someone in South Africa. You just start there. And we move among many people every single day. And I'm telling you now, people are open to listen to new ideas. People are open to listen to your testimony. So where do you put yourself among the people? Do you run? Join a running club. Do you walk? Join a walking club. Do you have WhatsApp? Join a neighborhood watch group. Are you into paddle? Then join a paddle group. If you're into Pilates, join a Pilates class. You know what I mean? It's not that difficult to just break out of your mold that is home and desk, home and desk. Don't chow at your computer in your office. Go and sit in the communal area and see if a conversation happens. Hang around the water cooler a bit and start with, how's it? We have access to people every single day. I'm that parent that goes to school to pick up the kids and then goes, uh, I haven't met you yet. Hi, I'm Reino, how's it? <laughs> Who are you waiting for? It's how I roll. Or you stand next to the sports field and after you go, go Amy's, go Amy's. Who haven't I met yet? <laughs> Ooh, I'm going to shift a little bit here. Yes, Amy's, go Amy's. Hey, <laughs> <I'm> Reino. <laughs> we have access to people. Paul had access to people. He spoke to anyone who would listen. Then we see he's in the marketplace and he's not only dialoguing with everyone, he's dialoguing with intellectual skeptics. Okay, so I have a lot of information here about who these people were. I think all of this information matters, so please stay with me. So Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. Paul is speaking to them. Epicureans were materialists. They believed that the body and even the soul were composed of fine matter and it dissolves after death. Eh? When we die, we become the grass and the antelope eat the grass. Mufasa? That's what they believed. And because they believed that, they were like, listen, the gods have got nothing to do with humans and we have nothing to do with the gods. The gods doesn't really care for us, so we shouldn't really care for them. And the way that we live life is we try and live our best life now. That was the Epicureans, okay? Eat as much as you want. If you feel hungry, eat. If you feel sexy, sex. If you want to steal, then take it. Like, do whatever you want. Because none of it really matters. You only live once, and if it feels good, do it. That was the Epicureans. The Stoics, on the other hand, they were what people called pantheists. So they saw God in everything. Listen, not everything was created by God. Not God is everywhere. They believed that God is everything. So they believed that something of God called the Logos, the Word, indwells everything that we see. It binds everything together. And the world was determined by fate. 
That's what they believed. So they said, we can't change anything about anything. So what you need to do is you need to be happy and you need to show it by clapping your hands. No, I'm joking. They really believe that you just ought to uh, rely on yourself for contentment, regardless of your circumstances. So for you to pursue your highest good, don't worry too much about what you feel, just worry about what you think. And they saw history as an unending cycle of order, chaos, order, chaos, order, chaos. So they would say to Paul, who says that God is near, yes, we believe that, Paul, but they would definitely reject the fact that Paul said history was moving towards a specific point. Because they believed that there was no point to history. Do you guys see it? Okay. What will be, will be. That's the Stoics. And that's how they spoke. You just grin and bear. You just stick through it. You can do nothing about it. Let me quote John Stott again. It was characteristic of Epicureans to emphasize chance, escape, and the enjoyment of pleasure, and of the Stoics to emphasize fatalism, submission, and the endurance of pain. So one group said, grin and bear it, there's nothing you can do about it. And the other group said, if it feels good, do it, there are no consequences. Both of these worldviews are utterly hopeless, fam, and meaningless. I mean, tell me, what kind of life are you going to live if you live according to this philosophy? Well, I actually think a lot of people in this day live according to this philosophy. Think about it. We have people wanting to live their best lives at any cost. And then we have people who are so utterly hopeless that they don't even think that they have a reason for being. Stoics and Epicureans. We don't call them like that anymore. But we engage with people who hold to this similar worldview. We have a growing number of people also saying that I'm, I have no religious affiliation. Have you guys heard of that? Yeah, like I, I think I kind of believe, and I might believe at some point, but I'm kind of on the fence. Paul goes to those people, he gives them a message, and the message he gives them flies in the face of what they believe. Because firstly, you matter and everything you do matters. That's in the face of the Epicureans. And secondly, God was orchestrating history to reveal himself fully through his son. And now you can be saved and you can live with him forever. It's not random. Do you guys see how clever Paul is? Okay. Now, let's look at the fourth point. What Paul said at the Areopagus. I'm almost done. I'm going to fly through these. Let me at least show you. Oh, wait, wait, wait. wait. Before I show you a photo. So we're going to cover six quick things. That Paul says. Okay, I'm not going to drill deeply into them. So, under the fourth point, we have six sub points. If you want to take a photo, <laughs> it's your opportunity to do it now. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. Let me show you a photo of the Areopagus. Here we go. It's in Athens, and there's the Areopagus right up there. It was a temple that was dedicated to the god of war, Arias. So, the Areopagus, it was called in Greek, and it was called Mars Hill in the Roman culture, because their god of war was Mars, like Mars, the planet. So about 50 feet high, about 150 feet, I would say, in length, a temple up top, you see the Acropolis in Athens up here, and then you see people making their way here through what is called the marketplace, all the way to the Areopagus. I don't know, it helps me to always have a picture in my head, it might help you, but that's where Paul is. So it's a place where people meet and where people debate, and where people decide on affairs. Okay, let's look at chapter 17, verse 19 to 21. They took him and brought him to the Areopagus and said, May we learn something about this new teaching you are presenting. Remember, people were open to it and they were listening. Now this guy speaks something that they haven't heard of, and then they say, We would like to hear a little bit more. Because what you say sounds strange to us, and we want to know what these things mean. <clears throat> now all the Athenians and the foreigners residing there spent their time on nothing else but telling or hearing something new. I already explained that. Paul stood in the middle of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that you are extremely religious in every, in every respect. For as I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship, I even found an altar on which it was inscribed to an unknown God. So Paul looks for something that can be a connection point. Okay? So he doesn't want to come with too foreign of an idea. He wants to mention something or connect with something that they know full well. And then he wants to use that as a starting point for his gospel presentation. Okay? 
Now, uh, what's important to know in verse 18, sorry, I just want to go back there, is you'll see that some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers said, what is this ignorant show-off trying to say? They called Paul a babbler. And what they meant was Paul was a seed picker. And what they meant with that was they said, it seems like Paul is picking a little bit here and picking a little bit here and picking a little bit here. And he's mixing different religions and different gods. And we, we can't see his story and the way that it all fits together. Now, that wasn't because Paul was unclear. That was because they had absolutely no paradigm or frame for the gospel message. The people in Athens actually thought that Jesus was a person and resurrection was another person. And they went together. So just two more idols. Okay, so let's make a statue for Jesus. Let's make a statue for Anastasis. That is what resurrection is in Greek. And then Paul now uses the opportunity and goes, no, no, wait, 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 wait. This is one long, unified, coherent story. Let me tell you this story. Let's start with the first one, verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it. Okay, so firstly, he tells them God is a creator. That's the start of the story. That's the start of our story. And I think in this world we live in, that should actually be the start of our story if we tell other people about Jesus. I don't think that it works anymore to say to people, if you die tonight, where are you going? Because people answer you with, I wasn't even thinking about the fact that I could die tonight. I wanted to send this reel to my friend. Okay? People don't, uh, people don't fear death. And secondly, if we tell people God loves you very much and He's got a marvelous plan for your life, Yes, that is definitely the truth. But because people are so self-absorbed and selfish, they actually do believe that God loves them very much and that they do believe that God's plan for their life is their plan for their lives. So, yeah, cool, man. I understand. Maybe a gospel presentation should start with God created everything. And He created it good. And He created it for the flourishing of humanity. And He put everything in its place. Look at the second one. God is the sustainer of life. We see that in verse 25. Neither is He served by human hands as though He needed anything. For He Himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. God sustains us. He is a giver to us. And He doesn't ask anything of us. Do you guys realize that? I was having a conversation on Friday with a Muslim believer. And the guy said to me, um, does the church accept money? And I said, yeah, the church accepts money. But this is important. The church accepts money that we call offering. Okay, we call it generosity. As Christians, we say thank you with our money. And we say, God, because of everything that you have given me, because of everything that you have blessed me with, because of the fact that you took away my sin and I didn't have to pay for it, for that I give thanks. And then he said, oh, that's interesting, because he was thinking of giving some money. And I said, oh, that's interesting, tell me more. And then he said, I feel like there's some distance between God and I. Now, he's talking about Allah, the God of the Quran. And he says, I, I just want to pay back a bit to, to make the distance smaller. And also, it feels like a lot of bad things have happened in my life recently. So if I give... He might save me from it. That was literally his words. And then I said to him, dude, that's one of the fundamental differences between what you believe and what I believe. I know that you think that we serve the same God, but we don't. Because my God gives. And my God gives abundantly. And my God made a way for me to be right with Him and I never have to pay ever again. So I give when I say, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I could see that that floored him. And then he said, yeah, but I also want to say thank you. And I said, yeah, I understand that. But I'm focusing now on all the other things that you also want to say with your giving. Fam, verse 25, God doesn't want anything from us, nothing. He gives. He's the sustainer of everything. So Paul was looking at all of these people worshipping their idols that enslaves them, that keeps them bound, that doesn't offer them freedom. And he says, I know of a God that gives you great freedom. I know of a God that doesn't ask you anything. On the contrary, He gives. Look at, number, uh, look at the third one. God is the ruler of the nations. Verse 26. For one man, He has, uh, sorry, from one man, He has made every nationality 
And he has determined the appointed times and the boundaries where they live. Fam, that's great news. If you read the news, the word looks like chaos. If people talk around the bride, they talk about the chaos of the world. Do you know what our testimony is in that context? God rules over all. And He has destined the times, and He has destined the boundaries, and I believe that He will bring it to fulfillment. And I believe that I have a role to play here and now, but I don't believe that I need to sort out the West versus the rest of the world conflict that's coming. It's not my job. God is over all of those things. And God died on the cross for all of those people. And everyone has got their finger on a nuclear button. God died for them too. And I should have a heart for them. Look at number uh, verse 27. God is knowable. He did this so that they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find Him, though He is not far from each one of us. Paul has got this picture in his head of people looking, 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 and looking, but being in the darkness. Imagine being caught in pitch darkness. You start looking, right very cautiously but the darker it gets and the more you can't see the more flustered you become and the more aggressively you start feeling around to find paul says that's what he sees these people doing frustrated people people in the darkness people who are looking people who are even more aggressive to find fulfillment and satisfaction in this world and he sees them that uh, 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 grabbing around in the dark and then he says he did this so that they might reach out to Him and find Him. Because He's not far from each one of us. Fam, God is knowable. You can know Him. That's part of the good news. Here's the good news. Jesus, died as a uh, Jesus suffered as a substitute for my salvation. Here is salvation. You repent, you receive, and you remember. It's as easy as that. And you do it by confessing and believing. That's the good news. And you should hear that today. That is how you get to know God. You hear the good news proclaimed to you. You respond to the good news by getting saved. And you do it by simply confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart. That's it. God can be known. Oh fam, that's one of the most beautiful testimonies we have. Is every day we get to know and know Him more. Even this morning in worship, standing here next to Marie, I saw something new. And I, I had a new kind of experience with God. Even closer and more intimate. And I loved it. I could go on for days. Sweat in the armpit. Sweat coming from the forehead. Let's go. We can know God. We can actually know Him. Better and better each day. Look at verses 28 to 34. 28 to 29, God is the Father of humanity. For in Him we live and move and have our being. Do you guys, yes, Naba? Yes, I do. Because she loves quoting this when she prays. Verse 29, we are God's offspring. Paul speaks to people and says, if you think there's better and worse, stronger and weaker, Cleverer and less cleverer. No, I'm joking. <laughs> destined for greatness and destined for not, you're making a mistake. God is the Father of all humanity. And if we don't love all humanity, we don't love the Father of all humanity. It's really important, fam. And then he says in verse 30 to 31, God now commands all people everywhere to repent because He has set a day when He's going to judge the world in righteousness by the man He has appointed. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising Him from the dead. God is a judge and He is a righteous judge and judgment is coming. God is very patient and He's waiting and He's giving an opportunity for people to repent. Listen to me, world. God is not giving an opportunity for you to choose how to live on your own terms for another day. God is giving you another day so that you have an opportunity to repent. It's part of our message. We can't just share the gospel with people and say, if you want to, carry on as it were. When we share the gospel with people, we have to tell them the gospel entails repentance. You have to turn. 
You need to turn around and you need to turn back. It's part of Paul's message. And that's the moment in his whole message where people went, whoa, 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 whoa. What you're asking of me now is a little bit too much. Like you were slinging it and we love what you're saying and we're understanding this whole story. But telling me that I should change, that's a hard message. But that's what Paul says. God now commands all people everywhere to repent. Fam, if you are witnessing to someone that blasphemes and you're witnessing to someone that hates Christians and Christianity, tell them God is very patient with you. And tell them again, God is still patient with you. And tell them again that God is still patient with you. But tell them, He's giving you an opportunity to repent. Because a day will come when you will bow, but then you won't bow in worship. You'll bow in submission to Him. It's part of our message. It's part of our message. And then, let's see what happens in verse 34. Some people joined Him and believed, including Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damari, and others with them. Some people believed, and some people don't. And Paul goes, my job is done here. I'm moving on to Corinth. And that's where we'll be next week. <laughs> we'll bring up that map again next week and show you. Oh, he left Athens, and then he went to Corinth. See, feel, go, speak. Amen. As we get ready to respond with song, I just want to focus on these four words and just give you an opportunity to reflect. Are you seeing? Are you seeing? Are you looking up? Are you looking in? Are you looking out? Or are you blinded by the blinders that you wear every single day, not caring about anyone else than yourself? Because that's a possible response, you know, to say, Jesus, open my eyes so that I can see. Maybe it's about feeling. Maybe your heart has just grown really small and really cold and really hardened towards other people. Fam, it's really difficult to love your neighbor if you can't even love your wife. And it's really difficult to love your colleague if you can't even love your friends. And it's really difficult to love someone that has authority over you if you can't even love your own parents. I'm calling you out on this. Our hearts need to be massaged with the gospel so that we can really feel for people close and far. Maybe that's where the conviction lies for you today. Let's think about where we go. Maybe your conviction or your response is, I am going to change my rhythm, I'm going to change my ways, I'm going to change my spaces, and I am going to intentionally engage with people outside my normal track that I go each day. I'm just going to linger a little bit longer. I'm going to ask one or two questions. I'm going to see if I can stir up conversations. I'm going to join this club that I've been, you know, saying that I'm going to join for quite some time. And I'm just going to pitch up there as salt and as light. Or maybe your conviction is around what Paul said. Maybe these six things are things that you actually struggle to believe. That God creates, that God sustains, that God rules, that God can be known, that God is the father of humanity, and that God is both a judge and he's a rescuer. Maybe your conviction lies there. That if Paul would preach this sermon here today, you would go, oh Lord, please help my unbelief. I actually don't, don't believe this of you anymore. Renovate my heart and renovate my mind. I just want to give an opportunity for us to think through it, to reflect on it, and then I'm going to pray for us. Lord Jesus, we realize that the fact that we have breath in our lungs today is not, it's not a coincidence. You willed this day for each one of us. And if it's your will, we'll have tomorrow and the day after and the day after. And we know it's because you put us in this place to be part of this mission. We want to remain faithfully committed to the mission of the church. We want to see we want to feel, we want to go, and we want to speak. And Lord Jesus, we need you, and we need the power of your Spirit to do this. So will you please, once again, set our hearts ablaze, focus our eyes, make our feet willing to go, 
and open up our mouths to speak the truth to people who need to hear it. People who you died for on the cross. People who you are wa patiently waiting for to repent. Help us to be your voice to those people. We worship you, Lord Jesus. We are in awe of what you've done for us. Drench our hearts and our minds with the gospel again. Now in this moment we pray. Amen.